Let's do it. Bonus time. I've got my uh, seven seven mix mushroom powder. I put in water with a tiny bit of cranberry juice. Do you, do you, uh, are you into the mushrooms? I've I've never I've never done psychedelics. No, I'm talking about just mushrooms. Oh, like, like lion's mane and reishi and stuff. They really oh, really yeah. help with my energy. Yeah. Like I've tried it, but I prefer. Uh, herbal extracts in alcohol like drops or teas mm. i drink a lot of tea nice nice i i only ever get in the only times i ever drink tea are in uk or ireland and then i drink a ton of it oh my god i am from europe so tea are from europe but what i do but coffee's european coffee is arabic imported right i mean everybody drinks coffee i'm like that's something that I just don't understand how people don't die drinking so much coffee because when I do it, I start sweating and my heart rate picks up and I just feel like I've taken cocaine. Well, that's some, uh, that's some good stuff you're uh, drinking then. But Turkey's part of Europe. And it's I hear they, part I of Europe and like part coffee. of Asia. It, it, has, it exists on both continents. Imagine if all we do is talk like geography for the bonus stuff. You'll be like, what the fuck? What are no. you doing? It's like two people who sort of know a little Something bit of more entertaining for them. Are we we're not recording, right? So like you Yeah, we're recording. It's all it's all good. So do you have any tips and tricks for magicians that might be useful that you like to give out i find everyone has one or two little sort of things they yes, like to, they, well, they I, believe I, be i'm a big uh, i'm a big proponent of journaling a magical journal is something that i have kept the practice for for always and i always will and it's my most important magical tool if i were to pick just one then this would be it i record dreams i record visions omens uh numerology, um, messages from spirits. I record every ritual that I have done. I record the manifestations of those rituals and a few other things like career goals, progress, you know, physical health, um, emotional, psychological health, insights. And, and I have a system about it. I might actually uh, publish it someday because like I have been perfecting it for a long time. So. This is something that I have like a hard time selling people on because it sounds kind of old world and boring and, you know, nobody writes with their hand anymore. But I personally would never give up my magical journal. To me, it's the tool that prevents me from losing track, from going bonkers, from just being overwhelmed. Um, Here's yeah. my little magical ink thing with the, and it's got a thing for the I love will. That. Yeah, I got that in Berlin 2018 when I was there to present at a culture conference. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. I had a metal, I had a glass quill that went with it that I loved. It was like a top quality one that I bought from the maker. And while it was, it was stolen by my buddy in Prague, he like ripped me off and like even did a bunch of like, yeah. I, I've yeah. actually had pens which I used to write spells and petitions and pacts and I did not have blood with them because blood just uh, you know it will dry up it will destroy the pen but what you can do is you can mix your blood with the ink and if actually if you do it with blue ink it will give it a really nasty sinister color so it will even look demonic so that's another tip I guess yeah, when and when when do you think people? Uh, what's what's your take on the uses of of blood in magic? I was just talking about this to someone yesterday on Reddit who was like, "I hate drawing blood. Like, how do I do it? Do I have to do it?" And there was an interesting discussion, which evolved from that, where I so I personally hate cutting myself, especially like my hands, because you know, like a, I'm a model, and b. Um, you know i type every day so why would i want to hurt my hands of all places yeah it's kind of slow to heal 
Yeah, I, I, I play instruments, so I'm very careful about my hands, you know. Some like, people will use the diabetic lancet, which you can get in pharmacy. So it's sterile, and that's what people that's what people do. Um, I will bite myself, like, you know, in the inside of my mouth. That's how I can draw the blood easily. It's diluted, but it doesn't matter. You know, sal saliva is also your DNA. The point is to seal the spell with your DNA. So you can use saliva, you can use your sweat, you can use sexual fluids, of course, menstrual blood for women. It's pretty powerful. Uh, you can use urine, but that's usually used just for rituals of blasphemy, protection, or banishing. Some people spill rather liberate amounts of blood on everything. That's one thing that I've kind of noticed among the black magicians, like the blood loss. Like, it's kind of creepy. Like, they really like spilling blood. You know, to each their own, if it's consenting adults or your own, or I guess animal sacrifice, then feel free to do that. But yeah, like, it's definitely a thing out there. It can be dangerous, though. Like, uh, in Haitian Voodoo, it is said that it can elicit the bloodlust in spirits. And then they will be asking for those things, which is something that you don't want. So you should be very careful, I think, and very serious about it and only really do it for special occasions or as a sacrifice. Like if you do this on behalf of another, like you really wanna help this person, you really wanna save this person, and you want to show the spirits that you mean it, then that's another case where you would use your blood. Yeah, the caution against uh, causing spirits to thirst for your blood is when I hear a lot. And of course, when you hear it a lot, it makes you wonder, well, so what, what are the, you know, give me the details. What are the details on when it's used and when it's not used? Some, some grimoires, it seems, um, Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but some grimoires call for the use of blood in sigils, and some. I mean, they, they do. It's very common. I have seen so many blooded sigils in my life. Um, it, it's super common in in the left hand path circles nowadays. In other circles, like the Santeria, the Palomayombe, they do a lot of animal sacrifice. Um, so they will spill the chicken blood all over every ritual. Basically, you always have to sacrifice at least the chicken which like to me that's bizarre but i guess they might find bizarre what we do so it's a, it's a cultural difference um my yeah, coven can... back in prague which was an all-female cult of lilith they used bloodletting a lot and it was to basically evoke the powers of the bloodline like to tap into ancestral powers to make it more powerful like you're not acting just on behalf of yourself but of everything that you carry and how would how would that be done what was the they they would have ra razors they would have either the lancets the diabetic lancets or like small uh small razors like if i would if i were ever doing this i would be using like my manicure uh tools you know which are pretty sharp and so i would kind of make a wrong move which is sometimes happens you know when you do manicure and that's how you can draw um draw blood okay yeah yeah it, it, it occurs in uh one of the published golden dawn initiations um but only once and uh, according to one commentator in the Golden Dawn tradition, it should have been put in a different initiation, which some orders then have had already preemptively figured out. But it doesn't occur often. It's not very common. I, I would be very careful about giving your blood in an oath to an order or to another person. If you do this privately with a spirit, that's between you and them. But once other people are involved, you will give them a very powerful fetish that can be used against you, which I guess was the point why all kinds of um, items were collected from the initiates back in the day to basically use, to be used against them if they were to betray the cult or, or leave the lodge, you know, betray the secrecy. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I mean, I have seen it happen even recently because it's like you send some magician your hair or your blood or nails or whatever, and you don't know where it ends up and what, the, what are they going to do with it. It's not so common nowadays, like this folk magic, just because we don't live in that traditional society where you would steal somebody's hair and, you know, bury a doll on their property and throw some war water on their door. This magic, I guess, still is practiced, but it's kind of dying out. So we will use photographs, handwriting, or just names, photographs very often. Like you can find them online. Everybody has them. Just print out the picture, make a screenshot. So that's what people do. Yeah, uh, one of the early guests on my podcast, actually, he was a guest from the old podcast before I was locked out of it. Um, and so he came back and redid. He was he's from the Appalachians, and he says it's a big problem there with uh, with practitioners putting their menstrual blood in in guys' coffee to to get them uh, in love with them, and that's a it's like a problem. It's, it's an old love spell. Um, yeah. It will basically bind the man to you, and it can be to elicit lust or to maintain fidelity, like to encourage loyalty. And that's when it's also like used with pins and dolls where you basically disempower the man from performing sexually outside of the marriage. I've seen that magic, it works. Yeah, yeah. And it, I think I think there's lots of precedent uh, for that in the uh, Greek magical papyri as well, right? That's uh, old practice, I think. Um, though that's not my... Realm of when, the, the basic idea is if you eat something it becomes a part of your aura instantly so spells and charms work through food and drink you know they have a lot of rationality behind them even though they are like not super common nowadays another old folk spell would be for a girl to touch her vulva with an apple and then hand this apple usually like a red apple to the boy which also has a significance of like it is said that eve gave adam an apple that's how it's depicted in european art of course it was probably not an apple or like you know i think it's some other fruit tree in the bible but in europe it's just an apple because that's the most common tree that we have there and apples are connected to love beauty glamour but also the other world and fairies so you know, it's not just about having him smell your pussy and get hungry for it via sympathetic magic. It ties back into, you know, old biblical Babylonian magic. Um, well, Hades, Persephone, and the pomegranate, right? Yes, she ate in the un underworld and then she was bound to return there. And always. again, a red, so, a red fruit and a very sort of sexual one, right? Because yes. it's a red yeah. seed. It, it, it looks very suggestive. Yeah, and you know, representative of both the male and the female because of the, the suggestive look, and then the seed element and it's red. It's just, it's a, it's a powerful So you myth. have like these, these folk spells, they look super trivial on the surface. Like it can offend people's sensitivities nowadays because it's like, oh my God, like that's like gross. Why would anybody do that? But if you do it from the perspective of the tradition that it's rooted in, it, it can be super powerful. And it can be just as powerful as complex demonic conjurations, pacts, or whatever magic you do in the temple in high magic. It's, it's just different. It's just the mechanics are different. It uses um, the forces of elements, the forces of nature, everything from fruits to spices to food you know, parts of animals, um, rocks, stones, bones, household objects, herbs. How do you protect against that stuff? What's uh, any good tips <laughs> for protecting yourself from uh, who might- uh, Maybe don't cheat on your lady to begin with. <laughs> Don't misbehave and we won't have to curse. Don't you. misbehave and we won't be doing it, I guess. Um, I mean, the, the, so there is a distinct male and female perspective on love magic. And I think it's just kind of unavoidable. So 
men perform lost spells a lot. Like they just want that conquest. Women are more interested in like getting rid of rivals, like maintaining loyalty, fidelity, or ending affair, you know, getting the rival out of it. Men sometimes do that too. So I have I, I have I have known a male magician here in the United States, and he said that he will never perform love magic for female clients because they are frigid bitches who just want to keep their husbands you know sexually starved and dominate them with black magic and he has such compassion for the poor man that he will not bind them you know to these women who just like are no fun and i'm like whoa that's a very interesting perspective but i guess he he lived in some kind of religious community where this is the type of clients that was seeking him out so you know like he he would not want to do it because he felt that this kind of request, even though it appears justified, that it was just not coming from a good place. Um, I, on the other hand, I would run into women who would be living in bigamy when they were forced into bigamy. Like their man had a different woman in another city and he would spend a week with one and then a week with another, which is pretty crazy. And, you know, she would still have a lot of moral inhibition to basically do anything against this rival so you know the lilithian witches they they knew what to do um and a, a lot of times this kind of magic it's not just about the ritual like it, it's it's coaching you have to talk to the person you have to advise them you need to keep them calm you need to keep them motivated you need them you need to keep them focused on the goal and it's going to take months. You need to make sure that they will not lose their mind. So you're like a lawyer to them, like an attorney or, you know, a therapist, all of these things. It's a very organic role, like the shaman, you know, the, like the folk village uh, healers. They, they, they just have to be there for the people. It's not about somebody sending you a bunch of dollars and then you perform a spell and tell them it's done and, you know, now go and don't bother me anymore. Yeah. So no, no good tips for protection. <laughs> I, I worry sometimes about my, I guess, my uh, brothers and sisters in, uh, in the, on the, on the dark path, you know, um, the, and that maybe they are, they, maybe they need to balance their focus a bit onto protection as much as attack, because I think I've done pretty good avoiding serious magical attacks in my life. Well, it's, you know, it's, it, it is violence breeds violence. You know, if you don't mess with people, they won't mess with you to a large degree until right. you run into some past life foe who will just start hating you once they see your face and like, they just, won't stop so they need to be obliterated yeah well do they i guess maybe i mean i have those foes for sure and they're they've done things i can't even speak about even on a patreon video otherwise i'll be deleted um and yet i've never done anything to any of them at all ever not one bit of retaliation i mean Tried it's a, it's a choice really you know some people they one. manage to destroy the karma by like purifying it redeeming it some people will just be created. So like it gets sent back and forth, back and forth. Um, I personally have been kind of on both ends. Like I've done some nasty vengeance punishment workings. They worked. I mean, those people were punished and they became better men. And then we even reconciled later. Wow. But then I kind of abandoned it because I saw how terrible these powers can be, you know, in my 20s. I was like, yo, you know, like, I don't want to go further. And then I pursued as much forgiveness as I could. And now I've kind of come around and I realized that, you know, like, you can't really forgive people if they keep doing it still. It's like, I mean, I guess you could through some mystical insight like med a lot of meditation you can just dissolve it but i just don't have the patience for it you know 
So I'm just gonna take it and throw it back at them because I'm not gonna sit here in an asana, you know, while dealing with trolls, haters, stalking, spying, blackmail threats, and all that shit. Yeah, and that's the that's the and that's the nice stuff. Um, yeah. I guess I've definitely been on the dissolving the karma path, as you would say. It, it's an investment in your future because see if you manage to defeat the enemy in this life, bring them like real loss and humiliation, make them end up in prison. They will likely spend years in that prison hating you and recreating this pretext for when you meet next. And when they see you next time, they will, they will, they will not... They may see it as like, oh yeah, yeah, I was a dumbass. I got what I deserve. They will, they might be full of that vengeance still, and they will see you, and their soul will recognize you, and they will be like, I spent my entire life back then in prison because of this motherfucker. Now I want to do something terrible to him. So you know, like either they will wisen up or you will wisen up at some point, or it will just continue on endlessly. Yeah. I think I'd rather I'd rather not dig two graves if I don't have to, you know? I'd rather I'd rather try and enjoy my life. I mean, it is short, right? I mean that's a question. Or, or you can just like you can also just like defend yourself passively. Um just like not resort to the same grade of weapons. Um, you know, you can just be mocking them, vicious mockery, powerful weapon of the bards. Of well, life. write yeah. a song about them, laugh in their faces, make a meme. I have written a few songs with some other occultist musicians. Well, actually, the Ryan of Praxis Behind the Obscure. We spent all night once going back and forth on Facebook writing a song about David Griffin. And, you know, there was some bad lines like, hey, David Griffin, whose butt are you sniffing? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe maybe we should record that at some point with better lyrics. But <laughs> uh, mockery is good. I like that. I like mockery as bardic magic. That is something I should own more because I spent a, over 10 years as a professional musician and end up. Uh, in the Celtic that, genre. That's your path. I mean, maybe you were even a bard at some point. So, you know, they say that, that they were feared because if they made a very good song about someone, a mocking song, that that song would be still sung centuries and generations after their death. And that's all that people would remember. David Griffin sniffing somebody's ass. Hey man, he, he broke into my place while I was on the throne doing an initiation in a golden dawn temple he broke in through the front door and if we hadn't had a sentinel with a fucking claymore who was like a strong tough metal worker sore woman like he would have gotten right into the temple and his the way he tells the story is he did walk in the temple we all stood back he walked straight past the candidates mid <laughs> he stood on the throne of the hierophant cursed our temple and then it fell down it fell right later. See, this, That's this the is, and, and then you are supposed to believe in history as it is told no it's not yeah. my friend recovered a random past life memory of killing some japanese master um he was like a hired assassin and he got past the bodyguards and then he was surprised and stepped in the back and he just happened to relate this random memory to somebody who knew the history of Japan. And he told him, bro, this really happened. And this is the year that it happened. But it's recorded differently. In the historical chronicles, it's recorded as the master stood valiantly facing the villain monk assassin and he beat him in a fair fight. That's not what happened. You know, according to sources, he was backstabbed by surprise. So here's, here's your version of a story, how it will be told, depending on which side makes better bardic magic, I guess, better I propaganda. I, you know, and it's funny actually, because the, uh, the first time I sort of, my first public appearance as a, an occultist in the scene, because it's a big deal, like 
a lot of you know, there's a lot of occultists popping up now putting out some of their written materials and doing new translations and stuff and please people don't start just practicing low magic and using uh crystals and menstrual blood because we need you to keep buying grimoires so we can keep fording to translate them and keep that <laughs> ball rolling let's keep that ball rolling i mean it, otherwise we wouldn't have like le petit albert and all these black pullets so well bound and available for affordable prices beautifully done so I didn't even realize on my, I was on, I was on the Esoterra Nerd podcast. I tried to do it in 2015, 2016, but it, the recording vanished. So we did it again, 2017. And I was asked by the Esoterra Nerd host, very honor, Fred or BT or Edward Reeb, uh, check out his podcast people. And that first episode, I knew I, he was going to ask me about the trauma of the end of Temple to Hootie, the whole David Griffin thing and the other schismatic and problems th that arose thereafter, right? And I'd never spoken about it. So I, I got very stoned before that and I was still in, in, in playing music full time. And I did to re re recount the story, but intuitively, even it was definitely a result of the bardic state I was in playing full time at, in 2017 still. That was the year I transitioned into part-time slash part-time doing writing again. And I did retell the story of David Griffin from a, like a comical point of view. I said, here's how, here's how it really happened. Obviously I was joking, but I told it as if he's like bumbling and can't find his way down the hall because he keeps falling over furniture and then he tries to get out and you know, all that sort of stuff. And I'm sure- I mean, I, I love the occult because where else do you find such colorful characters and such never ending stream of drama and interesting things you know yeah 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 like i i've heard stories where i am cast as a spy <laughs> organizing international conspiracy with like the feds and american military well you have an accent which means you're a russian asset right yeah no i mean obviously i'm a russian spy i mean Czech, I just can't Czech help Republic it. is still part of the USSR, right? Male, red haired, Eastern accent. I, I get it. I'm a spy. Oh. <laughs> that was what, so what was, what was dating EA quitting like? Oh, good. Well, there is stories circulating now on the internet. I don't, costing I don't me as a, as a paid escort that he paid a lot of money for. I don't know, man. Like, I guess somebody owns me because I've never seen any money. Oh, I like that. I like that. <laughs> you know, like you get to work with your infamy <laughs> and you get to typecast yourself and kind of start feeding those rumors in the right way. Because so that's the spy. Then we got this exotic escort. I mean, you can tie it together nicely, like in like an assassin spy who oh, masquerades yeah. as an escort and then i was also i also came across this slanderous libel that i tried to human sacrifice my ex-husband so i'm a black widow spy assassin courtesan i'm dangerous i mean it does sound like a bestseller right <laughs> yeah yeah i can i can see uh i can see that happening did, did did EA actually practice much? Oh, he practices always. He lives it. Like well, it's hard to I know unless you I've know gotten close enough to him to say that. Like he will have magical tools on him whenever he travels. Some divination, journals, candles, talismans that he never takes off. There's yeah, it's like and he speaks random prophecy all the time especially when he's like high on something which is uh a lot of time yeah okay that's about as much interest as i have in that honestly it's like it's a uh, i'm not uh, you know someone someone just today was trying to message me about the stuff on the golden dawn reddit and i should check it out i'm like yeah maybe but it's just not really my thing you know um but golden, I, Dawn, I, golden dawn has been involved in a lot of drama over the years yeah well i was going through i was initiated in 96 uh, into temple tahuti which was founded by the arabic adept who is now known as nineveh shadrach but he you know that was a that's a new name from um and he was awesome uh you know i only knew him briefly for the first year because he left over 
disputes around uh, gin work and stuff like that. So, which I always thought was too bad. I only found that out years later, actually. I was like, he was trying to bring in Arabic magic as an Arab himself who can actually translate Arabic texts. I'm like, why wouldn't we want access to like untranslated Arabic manuscripts? But there was, you know, power struggle between him and his, his, uh, his. And that, you know, this goes on in the white lodges and the black lodges. That's kind of the same thing. The power struggles, rivalry, just stupid treachery, banishing people, pronouncing yeah. anathemas, you know, blacklists. There's uh, there's always gonna be douchebags, and I always, I always like the the Dylan Moore, an Irish comedian, quote about churches. He says the thing about churches is they kind of tend to attract the kind of people who haven't done that well with everybody else. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean you can see this in all kinds of subcultures, not just the occult scene. Uh, it's like small town politics, you know. The smaller the scene, the more fringe, the the worse it gets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which is why I try and stay like civil, even, you know, in the Golden Dawn and OTO circles, I'm not thelemic at all. Or, it is I, possible a to a certain degree. I mean, I used to not have any enemies, like my reputation was stellar. And then, so I thought like naively that if you're just good to everybody, if you maintain professionalism, take the high road, that it will all be good, but it's, that's just not how it works. You know, people will level false, to totally made up accusations against you. They'll get this weird obsession with you and they'll just start this telephone game where they create this character, this like comic book superhero villain. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, like I totally understand why they want to hear more about this character because it sounds freaking badass. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the thing about, about rumors and reputations. They do tend to make people way more badass than they actually are. It's like, it's like I, I've run, I <laughs> run into people and like when they see me in person, they're like, oh, I imagined you be taller or more of a brunette. I'm like, bro, like, you've seen my photographs how can you be disappointed in me or they would be like oh i thought your place was bigger because i give out this grandiose vibe so they think that i'm tall that i live in a palace and that i have darker hair or whatever <laughs> glamour i guess yeah glamour magic huh yeah i uh I do think it's a it's a minefield the the occult world attracting Absolutely. a lot of um, yeah, and a lot of people get burned out and like they don't make it and they crawl away. I myself did this a bunch of times, but the pull has been strong. So you just have to develop tough skin and make it, or or you just have to leave, or otherwise you'll just keep being butt hurt all the time because there's always some drama happening. And a lot of it hurts. I mean, I understand covens falling apart. It's always been a big thing, you know, lodges. It's it's kind of hard to maintain a good group. Yeah. But there are groups that have been practicing together sort of low-key under the radar for decades. They do exist. Usually you don't know anything about them because they are not big enough to, you know, do all these politics. Well, uh... I don't know if you know this, but this is in published material. There's a lot of paperbacks up there. So I've not nothing against. I actually often I'll buy paperbacks over hardcovers just because they're lighter and easier to manage. And I don't feel as bad when I make crazy notes in them and highlight them. <laughs> um, the uh, one of this is a funny, a funny thing is uh, when when the Cicero started their Golden Dawn order in. Oh, damn. Is it 79? I believe it was 79. They didn't realize that that was the same year that the last existing original Golden Dawn Temple was closing in New Zealand. So they're actually, had they known about each other, and this is mentioned in one of Nick Farrell's books, they actually could have connected. And that would have meant that the Golden Dawn tradition that we have through the Cicero's today 
would basically be as unbroken as you possibly could but imagine. You know what I think, though, it is unbroken in the well, metaphysical sense. Of course, like of course. When, when one porch is down, the, the other one is lit. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a big difference in in this debate between inner teachings versus outer physical lineage and stuff like that. I mean, the inner teachings in the Golden Dawn uh, may say it quite clearly, um, like Mathers ended the Golden Dawn name a long time ago, 1905 is when the Golden Dawn ended, and he had the right to end it um, and to say it was done. So that is done but at the same time the things that continued are an occult order is a current once you put it out there it's out there it's not right like so the inner teaching is the current continues and it changes depending on who is who it's running through and what group it's running through so the groups are different even though they come from the same origin and this is where i really like the more traditional rosicrucian ideas like you see in rudolf steiner the ideas of the secret stream we have this in the ideas of uh, sophia perennis and the uh, prisca theology the idea of uh, either a sacred wisdom that has never changed throughout all of time that we're recovering or the idea that uh, we're reconstructing uh, the sacred path through you know ancient wisdoms and stuff it's a uh, yeah very different interpretations of tradition when you think of them in physical historical terms versus inner spiritual terms and the inner spiritual terms the golden dawn is you know governed by spiritual and guide and, masters and, angels. and you can connect with those beings to grant connect you know any anyone can create a magical group and then connect up with spiritual beings and get guidance from those beings and that's what the secret chiefs were and most magical groups probably should have that sort of thing going on. It's uh, there was a while for for a while it was a very weird period where people were suspicious of any of that stuff. And the Cicero order, I believe, still is rejects the kind of secret chief mentality or spiritual guides mentality, which I'm not sure how that plays out because I'm not in well, that. Group. In, so in the Latin path, after. there is like almost a opposite phenomenon right now where everybody is super after the original new grimoires which are basically channeled material and they're like give me the secret name of the spirit give me the secret sigil give me the secret mantra give me the recipe the formula that basically somebody pulled out of their ass you know and like you can do the same and maybe there is a reason why the traditional formulas should be used because i mean they have been tested you don't know what this black magician who channeled this grimoire pulled up from their ass or or if he and this is where we get to really dark territory let's say that the grimoire that they produced is not what it presents itself to be let's say that it's an intentional misleading piece of intelligence work which will redirect the power of everybody who works with it back to you you never know like do you trust some black magician mofo out there who put out a book that promises uh power do you really trust him that he's out there to empower you or himself well, that's the thing. There always will be people out there who do, like that 18-year-old kid in the UK. That's the subject of the movie that I'm releasing in exactly one week. It's the whole scandal. Jeez, you should have said that on the main podcast. And... Oh, yeah, I mean, you can point out your re your listeners to it, or, we can, or maybe we can, I don't know, record yeah, yeah. I've just released the fourth trailer, um, The Lord of Lies, the story of EA Coating. It recounts his controversial persona and the satanic murders and then the censorship where he basically loses his entire social media empire so this is what the occult community has been pretty much talking about last year so i decided to um you know compile all the clips and make it into a movie i think that's that's a good idea you know now that you mentioned it, i think yeah i might have heard something about that or from you maybe even i don't I, I, I don't know how much interest is it going to generate and like how fringe like because that story has reached the press like it yeah. doesn't happen very often that a story reaches this level of media coverage on both ends of the Atlantic the British press was the one who picked it up the first BBC 
And then it was on other British media. Vice was in on it, um, Fox News. The, I mean, the, and, and, uh, and the, it's the a true real crime one. channels, big true crime channels on YouTube that's got like, you know, half a million subscribers. So, so it did ripple out pretty far and wide. Yeah, I would say further than any other occult related scandal in, in my life. Well, yeah, I mean, I rem when I mean, the, the Damien Eccles thing happened when I was young. Um, and uh, of course, they thought it was a, they thought it was an occult slaying, which it wasn't, obviously. Um, and let's not forget about Varg Vikernes and the church burning in, in Scandinavia, the black metal, the black magic milieu. Yeah, well, we had, we just had a lot of, we just had, uh, th where I grew up here, we just had three, three Masonic lodges burned down and uh, a bunch of churches across Canada. Um, but it wasn't for occult reasons. Well, it was sort of for occult reasons. I mean, if a, if a, if a Mason buys into the conspiracy stuff and is like free the children and starts burning down the buildings like if you think there's children in there shouldn't you free them first before you build burn down the building i don't really believe yeah i, I don't i'm not a big fan of there. tearing down buildings or You're burning burn buildings or burning books you know yeah yeah no so the, so yeah a film coming out on the ea quitting story I, I mean it's funny that i had no idea uh your relationship with uh Matt, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't talk that. about it because like there was no reason to fuel up more drama and infamy, but it kind of has taken on a life of its own. So like, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you, one minute you're just uh, dating this uh, dude and the next minute. Yeah, the next minute you're a human sacrificing uh, spy courtesan who who is linked up with international press, uh, secret services, and the military to take down his empire. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of drug abuse in black magical circles. And that I think explains the grandiosity of the rumors that just, you know, happened there because it's it's pretty crazy. And, and paranoia also like, like you wake up one day and somebody wakes up telling you, oh, I spoke to spirit this and that. And they told me that you worked against me or like you caused some misfortune in my life. And they take this as a fact and they throw this accusation on you or they just block you and they start telling this to other people. And it's accepted as a fact, even though it's just like somebody's claim, like Satan told them in a puff of smoke and in, in a meth, you know, cloud. And, and then you get other people, you know, who are all triggered and insecure and paranoid and scared and everybody's threatening each other. It's, it's like a bad movie. <laughs> a bunch of tweaked out magicians all like paranoid. You know, like me, I into it, and if you start getting scared and if like you're not sober or you get some unresolved trauma, I guess I swear you can scare yourself to death. Like I'm surprised that, that there's not more people who are like, dying or killing themselves in this community that's an interesting uh fact i wonder if there's a i wouldn't be surprised if there's actually a, a lower suicide rate amongst magicians because even, even even i would say that it must be higher they just don't succeed with the suicide oh, okay you think it it's just lucifer rolls back time or brings them from the dead i've talked to people who like have tried to overdose 24 times during one week and they just could not die i've talked to people who were run over by a car and then they woke up and like time was on a different timeline people who had clinical death and they came back it, it's just weird like it's weird like black magicians often wish to die because their lives are like so on the edge and so miserable they just can't well i'm feeling and, very they, sp good. and they spend a lot of time trying to kill one another too which uh kind of slows down the progress of the black lodge you know yeah you know i i like i did i did at that time watch uh well i did watch two full live streams of, of ea's 
and uh, obviously not my cup of tea. But the reason I watched the first time was to hear if the calls for violence and human sacrifice to create a pact with Lucifer Reficol, uh were were true. And sure enough, before the end of the live stream, he did tell people that's what they had to do. And then so, so and then I told this so I talked to about with some people and they're like, no, 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 you misheard, you're misunderstanding. I'm sure. And that, you know, that's why that's why I named live stream and he did it again. And I was I like, don't okay, think that this controversy will be easily resolved because Satan is the father of lies. He just has different faces for different people. And people see that one face and they're like, oh, it's like all glamour. It's so beautiful. It's so wise. And then they see the other face and they're like, oh my God, what did I just witness? And you can't really reconcile it, you know? And the Lord of Lies, Lucifer, he just has that tempting face to reel people in. And then he pretends, oh no, I'm just, I'm a cute little snake. I've had a hard life. I would never condone violence. That's not what I do. There is material out there on the internet Everybody can watch it and just draw their own conclusion. But I just don't think that we will ever like settle on one singular judgment just because the like the allure, the seduction and the cunningness, it's an inherent part of black magic. Like a black magician basically is a con man for good and bad. Like I, I would call myself a charlatan or an entertainer. I would not feel offended if somebody called me that way. Like I, I own up to it. Um, yeah, and I like look at all the magicians of the past. Like didn't they have colorful lives? Spies, charlatans, fraudsters. You know, it, it, what you're saying actually is interesting because uh even for someone like me, like, so I did a lot of the purity stuff at a young age, avoided sex, drugs, alcohol, all the way through the golden dawn and into my twenties before I decided to explore some of, you know, what it was like to take a toke of a joint or have a, a couple. I was the same, actually. I grew up in, in the Catholic environment. So I was super straight edge. I actually only got drunk once in my life. It hurt so badly that I never did it again like i i don't get what people get out of it i just felt like my head was about to explode and i was so sick mm. i smoked my first joint at 25 yeah 20 24 i had my first toke with a so you know at the time where everybody was just kind of settling down and done with party i just discovered it like i was a late blooming yeah yeah even, even after i smoked that weed i didn't get into it for the rest of my 20s really at all it wasn't until i was like 30 that i actually sort of got into it and that, that even then it was for pain it wasn't for enjoyment yeah, yeah. and i and i mean it's it's very interesting about drugs some people just develop addictions easily i don't think i could get addicted to it even if i wanted to because half of the time it doesn't do anything the other half of the time it makes me sick so i'm like yeah well you know maybe i will take some weed when I'm like in really bad pain because it's better than the pain pills, which fuck up my liver. Oh yeah. But I've just learned that if you, if you approach these substances feeling like shit and lacking something and you expect it to make you feel better, it likely won't, or you will pay a terrible price for it. Um, like it doesn't solve anything. And, and I would include like the medical drugs pills, into this too because like what is an anxiety pill xanax like you know people take the same stuff recreationally to make themselves feel better you know so like and you want to get addicted to it i mean the state is the biggest drug distributor out there and they push it you know into nine-year-old kids under made-up diagnoses it's a pretty sad state of affairs I had, an, I had an aunt lay into me once when i mentioned a really beautiful acid experience I had with a reincarnated Tibetan master, like disciple of the Dalai Lama, who even gave me the acid. And it was a beautiful solstice experience. I just amazing, amazing winter solstice. It's just an amazing experience. And the aunt just, my aunt just laid into me and insulted the shit out of me in every way you possibly could. And while she was doing that, she was literally counting out Dilaudid pills. 
see and that's that's the thing you know people just people just don't own up to their shit and they're they are hypocrites and and it's just it's easy to see a lot of people talk shit about ea colliding because he's a very um open addict like it's so bad that he can't even hide it you know there's like no point in trying to hide it because it's too obvious he drinks and he does meth and everything basically when his personal stash of drugs was randomly discovered by the cops they were like no way you have this much for your personal use oh and the funny thing is i think it was for his personal use he just uses a lot (laughs) oh my god So a lot of people Um, like go on moral tirades you know crusades against him but what i discovered kind of getting closer to the people in that circle is that they all do it too they just keep it more secret and and they just will never admit it but like you can tell you know all the slurry speech like the weird skin the missing teeth so you know like is this just about having the straw man Yeah, I'm, I, I certainly, like, my issues, I don't have any issues with what people want to do with their lives and bodies that doesn't hurt others, right? Your, your body or choice, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's like, I will judge people on, you know, being liars, screwing people over, um, just bad deeds, hurting others. If you want to hurt yourself, you know, if you want to go to seed, mess up your own life, I will feel sorry for you. I'll try to pull you out of it but if you insist you know then there you go so what from what we know of historical magic and evocation especially the guedia we know that virtue is not necessary to make it work which is why you can be a you know backstabbing two-timing piece of shit and still yeah. summon demons or angels absolutely or and, and you can even st- you can even reach like high level yes you can Samadhi and I, I had the worst argument with my white magician husband when I told him that when I was a kid, there was a mystic a family friend of my parents who was in this prolonged state of Samadhi for months and people were like visiting him to be blessed because he was right there. He was communing with the angels. He was there. He was a pedophile. And my husband was like, no way, a pedophile could never reach a high state of samadhi and i'm like bro i've been there i witnessed it it happened i don't care what you think it doesn't work like you think like if 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 the world operated like you think it's so naive it's like it's not disney yeah no no however one thing we know from the tradition of Western magic is that purity is important. Virtue isn't for the operations to succeed, but purity is. Yeah, purity of thought of the operator. Right, like so abstaining from sex and drugs and these sort of things leading up, especially in the day, three days, seven, 14 days up to a a major evocation, especially, and and if maybe not primarily, but especially if you're going for some form of uh, physical evocation or manifestations at all, right? You really want that purity. I've always found it like it doesn't make sense then how you would cons- how you could be a serious practitioner of, of the goetic arts or of any form of evocational arts in, in modern Western magic, in the history of Western magic without while, while being so fucked up all the time. I like, mean, it, the thing is the drugs, they act as gateways. Like they, they open the portals in their own way. They, they make it easier to reach out beyond the veil but they also make it very unstable and it it damages people's mental health. So then they can't differentiate between their delusions, a lot of paranoia. I think that's also why like everybody is constantly about, you know, defense and curses and protections and all that. And it also prevents you from dealing with more deep rooted issues like trauma, It, it covers it up. So it's just a bad choice because it disempowers you in the end. It makes you vulnerable. It makes you overlook 
your weak spots, it makes you feel powerful when you're not. And a sober magician will always beat an addict magician. I would bet my life on that. Hmm. Maybe that's my last uh, false uh, pretense that I operate under, but I just believe that firmly. No, I think, uh, I mean, that's been, that's been proven by my experience. I mean, there's a reason um, I, I, I keep following those guidelines. You know what I mean? Like, I, I like my mind not being messed up. I like waking up happy and excited every year. Oh, it's the same for me. I mean, I have spent so much time working with my mind and altered states of consciousness. I just like the command of my psychic powers the way they are. And substances just mess with it, mostly just in a bad way. See, last time I got really stoned, I remember feeling, feeling angry because my higher self, my soul was fully lucid and it was like, Nora, you're dumb. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Like you can't even speak properly or laughing like an idiot. You're dumb. I can't wait for this high to be over. Like I felt ashamed of myself. It wasn't cool. Mm. You know, one of the things <clears throat> us white brothers, <laughs> damn, we got it. We see there, there's, there's more than just theoretical, magical reasons to stop using this language, honestly. <laughs> There's other reasons that we could just do away with the whole black brother, white brother language, right? <laughs> it's just not, it just doesn't, it's not, it's not. Well, well. you're as white as it, it is, well. so I'll meet up. <laughs> but yeah, but one of the things that most of us are, are, are most cautious about and worried about when it comes to getting attacked or damaged by spirits that we would be evoking with is when we're working with someone else and we can't be a hundred percent certain that they're going to observe the purity preparations because it's considered in the grimoire tradition quite clearly oh, yes. that that it's... you go into the circle with someone and they haven't observed the purity requirements that you have that's the most danger you'll be in from the spirit both I, I certainly agree that from my experience working with in a with a coven different practices but if a wrong person ended up there at the wrong time and they would be, let's say, under an attack, a curse, bad mood, in pain, or just something wrong with them, it, it can destroy the entire setup. So it, it, it's very important for everybody to be on the same boat and just, you know, not allow people in there who would mess it up or like, you know, and, and, and if, if you can't go through with it, then I guess do it some other time. These things, they have a way of just, you know, happening on their own pace. Hmm. The right people will come together at the right time. You just need to be observant and do your part. Yeah, yeah. I, that's usually when I lose potential magical uh, partners is when we discuss preparations and they realize what I'm talking about. Oh, come about. on. Are, are people and such then they see something nowadays? Like, always... you, can't, you can't put in this much effort and you want to become a magician. Go see a show if you want to see magicians. Well, and then I, so I end up then working alone most of the time because, you know, I'm like, can you handle three days of abstinence? And then they're like, or do you have to watch porn every day? And, and then they're like, like well, yeah, like, can you avoid watching anything of, with death on TV or, uh, you know, cut death? Like, fucking purity. Get in a pure state. If you don't know what that's ever been like, I recommend you try it just to feel it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the answer usually is something along the lines of, well, I take a more chaos magic approach. So, like, so you want to do, you want to do, uh, you want the results. That's a, that's a very you different, want, different the I mean, the, their like, spells oh, work, they're sigils they're work, you know, the, you know, it, it works, but it's just, that's just not, that's just not what me and you are doing. I, I've used chaos magic, but it's, oh, God. To me, it's a way of thinking that, is endemic to uh, all advanced magical thinking. Like, you know, there's the lesser mysteries, the, the outer orders of structured elemental workings, and then you move on to the greater mysteries of planetary workings. But you do get to a point 
where you start more and more embodying in your magical universe the the roles that you take on symbolically and spiritually whether it be osiris uh horror yeah, i mean they, they don't want to get involved too deeply they just want to do it like a method acting like i get into the role i get out of the role which is in theory a nice idea i just don't think that that's how it works to me as somebody who like lives with two demonic pacts you know, like, I can't believe in chaos magic. It, it's not like it exists one day and then the next day I decide it doesn't exist. Yeah. I, I, I have Lucifer take over my friends and possess them physically and speak to me through them. I think chaos magicians would crap their pants if they ever saw shit like that. And try telling me that that's just like subjective reality that you can alter, you know, on a whim. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not all in your head. No, I have seen manifestations of, I mean, I, I've seen some crazy shit. Like, you know, when I flew in to Las Vegas last month, the airport in Florida got almost evacuated. The fire alarm went on three times. Then uh, when the plane was finally loaded up and all the people were boarded, something happened and then it stood on the runway for two hours so you know i i have seen the lords of opposition work against me like i know how enemy works you know what it looks like i i, I know what it looks like when you know magic happens it, it, it's not subjective these events can be photographed and they are out of the ordinary and you know they follow a certain pattern yeah there are glitches in the matrix. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. This has been a wonderful bonus segment. I'm sure people will be very pleased. Um, I hope so. I, I know I was, so that's all that really matters. We had a good time. Um, yeah, great. This was awesome. Thank you. I, uh, I hope we can touch base in the future, maybe once your film comes out and we all watch it. And Sure. No, no, send me a link. I will share it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Anything you think can think of uh, you want to talk about or any questions you want to ask me before we go? I just want to invite everybody who's been enjoying uh, seeing me to my uh, YouTube live stream twice a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, 9 a.m. Pacific. Join the Monday Dark Arts or the Devil's Disciples. All right, folks, you, uh, you know what to do. Um, I'm so bad at endings. I don't know how to do it. Anyway, <laughs> this has been great. Um, I hope you have a lovely day in uh, Vegas, baby, Vegas. Um, you know, you. remember you're, you're so money and you don't even know it. <laughs> you know that film? You must. Maybe you don't because you're from Prague. No, I'm new here. If, oh, you need, okay. So you got to watch the movie Swingers. It is hilarious. It is genuinely hilarious. Like, yeah, yeah, just trust me on this. It's one of uh, John Favreau, it's John Favreau's first movie and Vince Vaughn's first movie and they made it together and it's fucking hilarious. Um, well, thank you. I'm gonna leave you with that recommendation since you're a, now a Vegas resident apparently. So yeah, live long and prosper, shalom. Peace, my dark sister. Many blessings from the white to the black lodge. <laughs> Likewise. Um, yeah. And go check out the third season of Twin Peaks. Yeah, you're going to love that. If you, Jesus, you're going to love that. Crazy. All right. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. Um, and thanks for being on the Patreon. It makes all the difference.